I want to ask in this paper a very basic and almost embarrassingly simple question about Christian thought around suffering and loss. Must a Christian on some level give these things, suffering, loss, destruction, a positive valuation? Must they, to put it a little more bluntly, in one way or another, say that these things are good? My own answer will be no, or at least I hope not. But even if the correct answer is indeed no, I think one has to say that Christianity faces a strong temptation to say yes, and therefore it's a question which is worth thinking about quite closely. To make the case that it's a serious issue, and also to give a sense of what I consider to be the temptation here, I'd like to begin with a discussion of Hans Urs von Balthasar, a Swiss Catholic theologian who died in 1988, and who in the years leading up to his death and since, has emerged as a figure of enormous influence in Roman Catholic thought and beyond. I should say right away that Balthasar does not, to my knowledge, anywhere affirm in a systematic, general, abstract way that there is an intrinsic goodness to suffering and loss. And yet I think something like this is suggested or implied by many dimensions of his thought. I'll embark therefore on a bit of a whirlwind tour to try to give a sense of how thoroughly an implicitly positive evaluation of suffering and loss form part of the atmosphere, part of the backdrop to this highly praised and influential recent Catholic theologian. Most of what I have to say about Balthazar here will also appear in chapter five of a book I'm publishing with Erdmans, due to come out in the next few months. The book is entitled Balthazar, A Very Critical Introduction. Let's consider first Balthazar's vision of the Christian life. Self-loss and humiliation regularly appear as key elements here, and Christian love is frequently discussed in close connection with renunciation and suffering. It's not so much that Balthazar offers specific arguments for a connection between suffering and love, or between humility and humiliation, as that one finds these connections made at nearly every turn. So for instance, if one reads only a single, relatively slim volume of essays in ecclesiology, slim by Balthazarian standards anyways, the second volume of his explorations in theology, one finds references to the church in its sinful members as borne by the suffering members and to the inner mystery of suffering of the church, to the true Christian spirit as the will to poverty, abasement, and humility. One can also find reference to the humiliation of Peter, which Balthazar describes as a real fruitful humiliation rather than a mere exercise in humiliation, or again to a humility which, because we are sinners, must be instilled into us by humiliation. And one can find references to self-abnegation in the service of Christ as the only way to reveal Christ's own self-abnegation, to a self-abnegation that liturgical piety requires and which is described as a violent, often crucifying sacrifice of the pious subject to the ecclesial object. Of course, I'm not telling you enough about the context of any of these little snippets to put you in a position to know fully what to think of them. And so, of course, I risk being unfair to Balthazar. But my concern at the moment isn't to establish that he's right or wrong about any particular issue so much as to convey something of the ambiance of his thought. I find it particularly indicative of the link Balthazar makes between love and suffering that even when he wants to express thanks to his family, he does it by reference to the suffering particular family members have undergone. After writing of the difficulty of acknowledging all those who formed him and made everything possible for him, this is in a, in a book where he, um, in an essay where he's reviewing his life and who he has to thank at various points, so talks about his family in a very general way, he then gives examples. A mother is there who during the course of a long fatal illness dragged herself to church each morning to pray for her children. Other close relatives of whom, to what ends, God knows, fearful sufferings were demanded. Only in the light of God will one really know what he has to be thankful for. These two things then, prayer dragged out through fatal illness, fearful sufferings for unknown reasons, are the only illustrations he gives here of what might call forth thanks. So in Balthazar's treatment of the Christian life, suffering and humiliation play a major role. And if we then look to his handling of Christ and redemption, 
to Balthazar's soteriology, we find a great concern to stress the intensity and enormity of Christ's suffering on the cross and in hell on Holy Saturday. He affirms with Pascal that Jesus' agony lasted the end of the world, and with Berul, the eternal openness of Christ's wounds. He writes that because of Christ's filial intimacy with the Father, he can suffer total abandonment by the Father and taste that suffering to the last drop. In general, he represents Christ's sufferings as exceeding and so in some sense containing all other suffering. He writes of wounds which transcend all innerworldly hurts and of Christ's suffering as towering far above chronological time. Never, he writes in his collection of aphorisms, will an individual man or the totality of all humanity even approximately grasp and encompass these sufferings. The notion of a special and privileged sharing in Christ's passion, as he takes it to be experienced in the dark night of the soul of the mystics, for instance, and in the intense sufferings of his associate, Adrian von Speyer, holds a place of particular prominence in Balthazar's thought. It's a theme which recurs quite often in his writings, and one which leads, among other things, to some interestingly distinctive interpretations of gospel scenes. When, for instance, Jesus says to Mary, this is your son, and to John, this is your mother, Balthasar construes this not as an act of care or provision of any kind, but rather as an act of rejection. What Jesus is doing here is denying Mary as his own mother. He is causing her to experience divine abandonment in order to allow her to share in his passion. Or when Jesus weeps at the death of Lazarus, as Balthazar reads it, he is weeping for the suffering he has inflicted on Martha and Mary. That's to say, by making them experience his abandonment, by his delay in coming to see them, he's drawing them into his own passion, and his tears are for their sufferings in their share of his passion. I find these two bits of exegesis really quite striking. In both cases, they are, first of all, highly unusual. There's some precedent in the Church Fathers, for instance, for interpreting Jesus' tears as tears for the suffering of Martha and Mary, but none whatsoever that I know of for this notion that Jesus intended to inflict suffering and an experience of abandonment on them in order to introduce them into his passion. And again, the notion that there's a rejection going on in what Jesus said to Mary and John on the cross is, so far as I know, unheard of in earlier periods. So important, it seems, is the experience of sharing in the passion of Christ to Balthazar that he construes these scenes in a way that, so far as I know, neither any historical critic nor any theologian of earlier generations engaged in the theological exegesis of scripture has ever done. He's fundamentally innovative, then, in seeing Jesus in these gospel scenes as engaging in a deliberate infliction of suffering on those whom he most loves. So far, I've talked about a depiction of the Christian life in which suffering and humiliation play a prominent role, an understanding of the cross which places great emphasis on the quantity and intensity of suffering undergone, and a recurring interest in the mystical participation in the Passion. To complete the picture, I need to say something about Balthazar's treatment of the imminent trinity, of the way Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to one another in eternity. And in some ways this, though the most elusive, is the most decisive bit, I think. Like many theologians who've gone before him, Balthazar understands the life of the Trinity in terms of gift. The Father gives everything he is to the Son, for instance. But unlike most previous theologians, he consistently construes this giving in terms of giving away, of giving up, in terms suggestive of loss. He writes that the Father strips himself without remainder of his Godhead and hands it over to the Son. The Father that can give his divinity away, the Father lets go of his divinity. This is an original self-surrender in which the Father must go to the very extreme of selflessness. He writes of risk in the Trinity, of infinite distance, of a primal kenosis, a primal self-emptying. He doesn't quite affirm that God suffers, but he writes of something which can develop into suffering in God, a supra-suffering. Balthazar's reasons for writing in these terms have to do in part with his understanding of the way the cross relates to the Trinity and of the way, therefore, our understanding of the Trinity needs to be shaped by what we learn from the cross. It'd be instructive to go into a full discussion of this and equally of how and why other theologians have not drawn the same conclusions about the nature of the Trinity from the cross. 
and I do go into that a bit more in the book chapter I mentioned. But for the moment, all I want to do is to note the way in which it plays its part in the overall atmosphere of Balthazar's theology, an atmosphere in which the best and the worst, the highest and the lowest, are constantly brought together so that love cannot be imagined without suffering or something like it, or bliss without loss. If the Trinity should not be thought, as Balthazar as asserts, in a way which abstracts from concrete pain, so he says the Trinity should not be thought in a way which abstracts from concrete pain, or which lacks what he calls the seriousness of separation and death, then we have, it seems, a system of thought which at its ultimate level, as well as at every other, gives suffering and loss a positive valuation. Mary Daly, the radical feminist with an engaging knack for pithy phrases, famously said, if God is male, then the male is God. The corollary here, to press my point to its furthest extreme, would be that if loss is in God, then loss must be somehow mysteriously divine. Perhaps a somewhat milder way to pursue this point is to ask where in all this Balthazar stands in relation to the tradition of regarding evil as a privatio boni, a privation of goodness, a lack, rather than something in itself substantial. This understanding is rooted in the doctrine of creation. There is no separate source of things other than God, and so everything that is must be created by God, and therefore must be good. According to this tradition, then, we need to insist on a fundamental asymmetry between good and evil. The two must never be related to God in the same way. Evil cannot be understood as something equal and opposite to good, because it cannot be allowed to be substantial. It cannot be thought to share in the is of all that is and is created. God, that's to say, cannot be said to be the cause of it, though one does speak of God in this tradition as permitting evil. The way I myself would be inclined to develop the notion of the privatio boni would be in terms not of a really well understood grasp of the distinction between causing and permitting, and so of the way God relates to evil, but rather in terms of the incomprehensibility of evil in light of an affirmation of the goodness of creation. But in any case, how does Balthazar relate to all this, to this tradition of the privatio boni? While suffering does not exist in God, according to Balthazar, there is supra-suffering, something which can develop into suffering, something with, which is analogically like suffering. And the distance I spoke of a minute ago, the infinite distance between father and son, what Balthazar calls the incomprehensible separation between them, is closely related to the realities of sin and alienation. According to Balthazar, when the drama between father and son is played out on the cross, the alienation of sinful humanity from God is taken up into the Trinity itself. But this does not produce something new, introduce something new into the Trinity because of this distance. So it, because of the distance that was already there, nothing new is introduced into the Trinity because of something already like alienation in the Trinity. At one point, Balthazar also says that this inner Trinitarian distance is the ground of all created difference and of the possibility of sin itself. For Balthazar, then, it seems suffering and indeed sin itself are positively rooted in God, positively related to God. They do not at least lie so clearly outside of that which God causes with anything like the clarity that they do in the privatio boni tradition. The dark and the light are both grounded in God, both ultimately encompassed by God. Sin and suffering are, in his thought, granted as much reality, as much ontological status as God's good creation. All this I find disturbing, and reading Balthazar was a significant factor in turning my mind to this question of what value we ascribe to suffering. What's perhaps even more worth noting, however, than the fact that this ambiance pervades much of the work of an influential theologian, is the fact that there seems to be very little comment on this theme in the vast secondary literature surrounding Balthazar. One can easily find discussions devoted to the question of whether Balthazar is or is not proposing that God suffers but almost nothing on the question of the value he gives to suffering itself. The only exception I've come across in my reading of the secondary literature is Alyssa Lyra Pitstick, who has a couple of characteristically forceful things to say on this point. The lacuna, the gap in the literature, is one of the things that make me think that the question I'm raising may really be worth asking. It sits somewhere quite close to two other questions, which do get quite wide discussion whether God suffers on the one hand, and whether a nonviolent conception of atonement is possible on the other. But my hypothesis is that it's really a slightly different question, 
and one that's an important question, perhaps even a divisive question for Christian theologies. What would it mean then to turn one's face systematically against any positive valuation of suffering and loss? One might want to say, first of all, that in God, gift and love have nothing intrinsically to do with pain and diminishment. God creates the world without becoming less in the process. And if we talk about the Father giving everything to the Son, we should insist that this is a giving in which there is not even a hint of becoming less, a giving which requires the introduction of no language of risk, emptying or loss. And if we say all this, of course, we'll be talking in a very traditional way. And then we might want to say that this fundamental pattern, a pattern where giving does not diminish or deplete the giver, should also govern our reflections on the nature of what is at the heart of created gift and love. There are many things I can give without being diminished. My friendship, my attention, even my recipes. If we do not begin by associating gift with loss, then we might perhaps take, take such examples, the giving of friendship, attention, and recipes, not as the paradoxical examples of giving, but as the paradigmatic examples. And however frequently love, or some kinds of love, must in fact become sacrificial, on this view we would nevertheless, and I'm using sacrificial here in its, its ordinary use in our language, not in a technical theological way, the way, the way people ordinarily talk about sacrificial love. Um, so on this view we would nevertheless be wary of the term sacrificial love, for on this view it's not of the essence of love itself to involve sacrifice in this common sense of our time and loss, although it may well be what love in particular circumstances requires. Now you might ask whether there's really any difference here. What's the dis difference between talking of love as sacrificial and talking about love which in some circumstances needs to involve sacrifice, particularly if these circumstances are likely to be widespread or perhaps even universal? To take a mundane example, what, exam what experience of parental love does not have an element of suffering and loss to it? Why not simply acknowledge that it is by its nature sacrificial? I think in fact that the distinction, though elusive, is real and has consequences both practically and theoretically. For instance, if I define maternal love as sacrificial, then I might be tempted to think that the more I suffer in service of my children, the more truly I'm loving them. And if I think this way, I might be a little more inclined to take some decisions that are bad for me and perhaps worse for my children. In fact, in my experience, those women whom I most admire as excellent mothers, those whom I most admire in their capacity to love their children, are not those who suffer the most, but those who suffer the least in the process. Clearly, this is a position which would need much more development and examination. There are questions to be addressed about whether all suffering and loss can really be lumped together, about whether some kinds of suffering are necessary for growth, about the relation of suffering to finitude, and so on. But even if I suppose the position could be developed more fully, and these questions all dealt with satisfactorily, I would still face quite another kind of challenge. Would such a position, which refused to find meaning and value in suffering and loss, really be a Christian position? Will it turn out that turning one's face resolutely against all positive valuation of suffering and loss is, in fact, turning one's face resolutely against Christianity itself? There are a number of ways the challenge might be posed, including what can be made, for instance, sorry, including what can be made on such an account of the paradoxical reversals of the Beatitudes, of the teachings say that anyone who would save his life must lose it. But the most fundamental and obvious issue, and the one I'll focus on, this paper is surely whether on such an account one can do any justice to the cross. Something to be said for a figure like Balthazar, of course, with all his dwelling upon and almost relishing of suffering, is that one can never doubt that he's taken the cross very seriously, that he gives it center stage. So my question becomes this, can we in fact set our face against any positive valuation of suffering and loss when we find at the center of Christianity as the climax in a way of the gospel stories, or, or very near the climax of these stories, the story of a life cut short in a suffering death. 
To give the issue a little sharper focus, I want finally to come to the issue of the presence of Christ, which was alluded to in my title. For if, as I'm going to propose, we particularly discern the presence of Christ in certain kinds of life marked by suffering or cut short in an early death, if that's the case, how can we at the same time refuse to acknowledge there's something positive in suffering and loss? So that's the problem I'm setting myself. Uh, consider the following two stories. Both of them have been in the news in the past year or so. Both of them were very recent when I first wrote this paper. Shabazz Bhatti, the Pakistani minister for minorities, had been campaigning against the blasphemy law of that country. He was at risk and knew it. He was provided insufficient security by the government, but didn't go into hiding. He was gunned down in March 2011. Jose Claudio Ribeiro de Silva was a campaigner against illegal logging in the rainforest in Brazil. He received death threats. He predicted his death in late 2010 and spoke of his fear of it. He continued his campaign. He and his wife were shot and killed in May 2011. These are both stories at the very least of tremendous loss. In each case we have, in particular, a life marked by fear of death followed by actual death. The life is destroyed, the years the person would have had to live out are lost, the mission to which the person was dedicated thereby presumably weakened, if not snuffed out. I've read nothing to suggest that Bhatti's death has led to a resurgence of religious tolerance in Pakistan, nor that De Silva's has led to a new protection of the rainforest. We could also think of Archbishop Oscar Romero in this context, whose death was followed not by the victory of his message, but by a long, terrible civil war in El Salvador. And yet my hypothesis is that a Christian, or at least many Christians, cannot hear of such lives and deaths without sensing in them, in quite a particular way, something of Christ. These patterns of life and death seem to speak of the presence of Christ in a very particular way. So could we say that what's positive in these lives, what speaks of Christ in them, isn't the suffering or the loss, but the steadfastness or the commitment to love or justice or doing the will of the Father. But then why is it that it's precisely such lives as these, lives marked by the wastefulness of an early death, which seem to speak to so many Christians in a powerful way of the presence of Christ? What I want to suggest is that it's not in these lives, sorry, what I want to suggest is that it's, it's not that in these lives a Christian will s respond to some dimly perceived and mysterious ultimate value in suffering and loss, as, as a thinker like Balthazar would suppose, so much as that in them we see worked out an ultimate indifference to suffering and loss, a refusal to, to be moved by suffering and loss. So if many Christians, when hearing of such a pattern of life, will see something of Christ in it, this doesn't mean that they identify some mysterious value to the suffering and loss itself, but that what they're noticing is the indifference to suffering and loss on some ultimate level. Not a complete indifference, of course. On an emotional level, there's clearly no indifference whatsoever to suffering and death, but a straightforward reaction of fear. This is clear in the Gospels from what we're told of Jesus in Gethsemane. Historically, it's clear from conversations recorded with Oscar Romero and even from brief newspaper articles one can read about De Silva. But on the level of the course of action chosen, the living out of the commitment, we do have an ultimate indifference in the sense that the action taken is taken exactly as if there were no threat of suffering or loss. The necessary course is walked, not as a compromise between what needs to be done and the desire to avoid a backlash from the forces of death and destruction, but exactly as if there were no such forces at all. What we might say, in fact, is that whereas in Balthazar we found a moving away from the tradition of the privatio boni, away from the tradition of denying substantial reality to evil, here we have a kind of enacted privatio boni. In those lives where we perceive the presence of Christ in this distinctive way, what we perceive is a kind of denial in practice of any ultimate reality to suffering and loss. These things are given no weight. They are allowed no influence. They do not dictate or even have the slightest influence on the choice of a course of action. They're not treated as substantial. The action proceeds as if they were not, even though or even as the actor is destroyed in the process. <laughs>
Of course, this isn't a general recipe for all Christian action. I ought not, for instance, ignore all risk of suffering and loss every time I cross the street, so that because of my commitment to the goal of getting to the other side, I'm indifferent to the question of whether or not I'm run over by a car. Um, if we really do refuse to give suffering and loss a, a positive valuation, then in general and as a first principle, these things are to be avoided, fought against, resisted. We ought never to aim for them on this account, never consider them a goal. And it follows that we also cannot aim for this pattern of life I've been describing, even if it's the case that in this pattern of life the presence of Christ is particularly visible. One way of understanding this phenomenon, that in a certain pattern of life the presence of Christ is, mo is most visible, or is very visible, and that nevertheless this is not a pattern at which Christians can legitimately aim, might be as follows. In the ordinary course of affairs, I can never be sure of the purity of my motives, the depth of my actual commitment. Am I running a soup kitchen, or giving a theological paper, or campaigning on a political issue because I'm fulfilling my mission, because I love the poor, or the truth, or justice? Or am I doing it because I love the recognition, the sense of achievement, the praise it brings? This ambiguity to ourselves as well as to others, to ourselves perhaps even more than to others, is the normal state of affairs, the normal situation in which the Christian must dwell, or any human being. But on some occasions, it may happen that support of the poor, or the pursuit of justice, or the, the, the pursuit of truth, or the love of justice requires that all else be subordinated, put at risk, even lost. And on such occasions, it will become clear to others, at least, that there really was a certain truth to this person's mission, a genuine presence of Christ in them. Actively to seek suffering and loss on this account, however, would be to seek not the fulfillment of one's own mission, whatever it might be, but instead the confirmation of one's own authenticity. And this in itself, this would in itself be something already gone wrong. This would be to seek one's confirmation of one's Christian status, of the presence of Christ in one's life, rather than to pursue one's actual mission, whether it be feeding the poor or pursuing truth or struggling for justice. Actively to seek a life of suffering and loss, then, to dwell upon these as things to be desired and sought, would be to misunderstand both the fundamental nature of suffering and loss themselves, which themselves on the account I'm giving are simply not good, not to be sought, and also to misunderstand the nature of the Christian life. This paper is ranged quite widely, so what I'd like to do to conclude is to kind of sum up in thesis form what I'm trying to get across. First, Balthazar's theology is marked on many levels by a positive valuation of suffering and loss. Secondly, though he's enormously influential, and though a vast and growing body of scholarship surrounds his writings, this is something hardly ever noted or discussed in secondary literature. So I'm proposing that more generally this is an interesting question to put to Christian theology. It's an issue which is somewhere in the vicinity of, but not really quite the same as, the issue of divine impassibility on the one hand and of violence and the atonement on the other. If one wants to refute, to refuse any positive account of suffering and loss, however, one confronts the question of whether one can do justice to the prominence in Christianity of the cross. One way to put a sharp point on this question is to take note of the fact that it seems Christians particularly discern the, discern the presence of Christ in lives patterned in a particular way by suffering and early death. And it's not quite enough to say that in such lives what we're moved by is love or justice or a commitment to a person's God-given mission, whatever that is. We are indeed moved when we see such lives by the relation of these lives to suffering, loss, early and unnecessary death, but it's not a positive relationship, a relationship of embrace, embracing, tasting them to the last drop, moving positively towards these negative realities, so much as a relationship of, when necessary, utterly ignoring these things, acting in the midst of evil as if it were not. What I'm offering here is, of course, not a whole Christology or account of atonement or of the nature of the Christian life. Christianity has to grapple with suffering and loss because of the nature of the world and because of the nature of the Gospels. And if it's to be good news, 
it has to say something positive in relation to suffering and loss. But it makes all the difference, I want to suggest, whether what it has to say that is positive is construed in terms of embracing it as that which is ultimately bound with love, as I think Balthazar does, or overcoming it as that which cannot fundamentally touch love.